Well, th thank you, Bob, and, and uh, for your questions, and, and I agree we will have lots more time during the reception. Uh, we do want to switch gears in part uh, because we have the great opportunity uh, to contradict everything I said earlier by having uh, Severn Cullis Suzuki take a break from uh, her maternity leave uh, to, uh, to join us remotely. Fortunately, she is not uh, coming uh, from uh, from uh, Canada, but actually just we're doing this whole thing remotely. Uh, but in a moment, uh, first, I, I, we want to just show her as a child. For those of you who are not familiar with Severn, uh, she spoke at the 1992 Rio Summit when she was nine years old. Uh, at, at that point, I was uh, eating Chips Ahoy cookies and playing Nintendo, uh, and this little girl, younger than I was at the time, was founding an environmental group uh, and traveling to Brazil to speak to the world's leaders, challenging them uh, to share the bountiful resources that industrial countries had with others uh, and to act to protect future generations and most importantly, to recognize that we don't always have all the solutions, so we better not break something if we don't know how to fix it. Uh, and it's just such a powerful speech that we're going to play it again for you just in case you haven't seen it. Uh, and then uh, we, I have the great uh, opportunity to introduce uh, her uh, via Skype. Uh, she has continued ever since then to be deeply engaged as a speaker, as a writer. She studied ethnoecology. She was on the Earth Charter Commission. She's on the ch uh, board of several organizations. She's even been a, a host for several uh, nature shows on TV. Uh, and continues to be a champion with the coming upcoming Rio conference, being part of the Canadian Earth Summit initiative. Uh, and now she has, uh, 20 years later, she is not only uh, no longer a little girl, but actually a mother of two. So she has a whole new perspective on this. So let us uh, show quickly. It's only a seven-minute video. Uh, maybe uh, uh, we'll play that, and then we'll dial in Severn. Hello, I'm Severin Suzuki speaking for ECHO, the Environmental Children's Organization. We're a group of 12 and 13 year olds trying to make a difference. Vanessa Setti, Morgan Geisler, Michelle Quigg, and me. We've raised all the money to come here ourselves, to come 5,000 miles to tell you adults you must change your ways. Coming up here today, I have no hidden agenda. I am fighting for my future. Losing my future is not like losing an election or a few points on the stock market. I am here to speak for all generations to come. I am here to spe speak on behalf of the starving children around the world whose cries go unheard. I am here to speak for the countless animals dying across this planet because they have nowhere left to go. I am afraid to go out in the sun now because of the holes in our ozone. I am afraid to breathe the air because I don't know what chemicals are in it. I used, to go in, I used to go fishing in Vancouver, my home, with my dad, until just a few years ago we found the fish full of cancers. And now we hear of animals and plants going extinct every day, vanishing forever. In my life, I have dreamt of seeing the great herds of wild animals, jungles and rainforests full of birds and butterflies. But now I wonder if they will even exist for my children to see. Did you have to worry of these things when you were my age? All this is happening before our eyes, and yet we act as if we have all the time we want and all the solutions. I'm only a child and I don't have all the solutions, but I, know, I want you to realize neither do you. You don't know how to fix the holes in our ozone layer. You don't know how to bring the salmon back up in a dead stream. You don't know how to bring back an animal now extinct. And you can't bring back the forest that once grew where there is now a desert. If you don't know how to fix it, please, Stop breaking it. 
Here, you may be delegates of your government, business people, organizers, reporters, or politicians. But really, your mothers and fathers, sisters and brothers, aunts and uncles, and all of you are someone's child. I'm only a child, yet I know we are all part of a family, five billion strong. In fact, 30 million species strong. And borders and governments will never change that. I'm only a child, yet I know we are all in this together and should act as one single world towards one single goal. In, in my anger, I am not blind, and in my fear, I am not afraid of telling the world how I feel. In my country, we make so much waste. We buy and throw away, buy and throw away, buy and throw away, and yet northern countries will not share with the needy. Even when we have more than enough, we are afraid to share. We are afraid to let go of some of our wealth. In Canada, we live the privileged life with plenty of food, water, and shelter. We have watches, bicycles, computers, and television sets. The list could go on for two days. Two days ago here in Brazil, we were shocked when we spent time with some children living on the streets. This is what one child told us. I wish I was rich. And if I were, I would give all the street children food, clothes, medicines, shelter, and love and affection. If a child on the streets who has nothing is willing to share, why are we who have everything still so greedy? I can't stop thinking that these are children my own age, that it makes a tremendous difference where you are born, that I could be one of those children living in the favelas of Rio. I could be a child starving in Somalia, or a victim of war in the Middle East, or a beggar in India. I am only a child, yet I know if all the money spent on war was spent on finding environmental answers, ending poverty, and finding treaties. What a wonderful place this earth would be. At school, even in kindergarten, you teach us how to behave in the world. You teach us to not to fight with others, to work things out, to respect others, to clean up our mess, not to hurt other creatures, to share not be greedy. Then why do you go out and do the, uh, do the things you tell us not to do? Do not forget why you are attending these conferences, who you're doing this for. We are your own children. You are deciding what kind of a world we are growing up in. Parents should be able to comfort their children by saying, everything's going to be all right. It's not the end of the world. And we're, and we're doing the best we can. But I don't think you can say that to us anymore. Are we even on your list of priorities? My dad always says, you are what you do, not what you say. Well, what you do makes me cry at night. You grown-ups say you love us, but I challenge you, please, make your actions reflect your words. Thank you. Incredibly powerful speech, and uh, I can't help but reflect for one second while we're getting Severn. Note that there was five billion people 20 years ago, and we have lost a lot of time and a, and a lot of ecological space. And it, and everything she says now, other than the five billion, is even more true today. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Yes, I can. Great. So no introduction. Hello, everyone. Uh, yes, Severn, uh, we already introduced you, so please take it away. Excellent. 
Well, thank you very much. Um, hello from Haida Gwaii. I'm on the archipelago of um, Haida Gwaii, formerly known as the Queen Charlotte Islands. It's an archipelago not far from the Alaskan Panhandle, and um, I'm I'm truly honored to be using this technology to be speaking to you all this afternoon. I have uh, appreciated for years the research of the World Watch Institute. The research that uh, this organization does is key to being able to assess and evaluate the global situation and to offer a path forward. And in 2012, we are desperate for a clear path. 20 years ago, I was 12 years old. I was uh, a little girl. And in 1992, that June, I traveled to the Earth Summit in Rio de Janeiro to speak to my planet's leaders. I was there with four other children, my little sister and my three friends who were a club called ECHO, the Environmental Children's Organization. We'd started the group because we were worried. We were worried about the problem facing our environment, facing our future. And through the support of our community and individuals who believed in message and our message, the help of our parents and a lot of hard work, we worked at the NGO Global Forum, we'd spoken at the Earth Parliament, and finally we were invited to speak at a plenary session at the UN. I was given five minutes, and that is when I gave that speech that you just saw. <clears throat> The response was passionate. Many members of the audience shed tears, many rose to their feet. It was a very, very powerful moment. We achieved what we'd set out to do. We as a little club of children, we, d we had decided that we wanted to speak to the world leaders. And we believed that through this show of uh, response, this response we got, we had achieved our mission. We hoped that they had truly heard our words. Years later, the video of the speech somehow found its way onto the internet and to YouTube, and this is how it has gone around the world. Today, 20 years later, I'm a veteran environmentalist. So I'm age 32. I've committed the last 20 years of my life to trying to influence societal transformation to a way of life that remembers the future. Yet those five minutes speaking to the UN remains the most powerful action that I have taken. It has certainly defined my life. People are moved to listen to a child speaking truth to power. And as an uh, isolated event, as, a, a, as um, something that's almost become separate from myself, I find that speech and the phenomenon of how it's spread through the internet really a fascinating, fascinating, fascinating to analyze and look at. 20 years later, people are asking the girl who silenced the world for five minutes for reflection on our progress on the eve of the anniversary at Rio, of Rio. And as someone who's dedicated my whole life to the movement towards sustainability, and today as a mother, this question is essential, but it is also sometimes painful to consider. I believe that this anniversary moment is an important opportunity for the global community to look over our path over the last two decades. This is the time for asking ourselves honestly, have we achieved pro progress in creating a sustainable and a prosperous future? Looking through any of the World Watch Institute reports since Rio, I believe the answer is clear. We have not succeeded. The ecological and human challenges are more acute than ever. The people dedicated to the transformation of our society to one that will survive, we must ask ourselves, why? Why have we not been more successful? And then we must begin to chart a new course of action. <clears throat> so what do I know has happened in the last 20 years? Well, in 20 years, I have changed. I have grown up. After the Rio Summit in 1992, I began high school. I played basketball. I enjoyed science. And at the same time, I began to travel around the world, continuing to try to be a voice for intergenerational justice. 
I participated in more conferences. I went to Rio again at Rio Plus Five for the UN's Rio Plus Five. I participated in prep comms for Rio Plus Ten. I had the privilege of sitting on the Earth Charter Commission and was a special advisor to the UN Secretary General in preparing for Rio Plus Ten in Johannesburg. I was at the Kyoto Protocol Conference in 1997 and at subsequent um, COP meetings afterwards. However, over the years, with each conference that I attended, I sensed that sustainability as an issue was losing its traction. The frustration of the grassroots organizations attending the conferences in hopes of influencing the negotiations were, was always palpable. I remember at the 10-year anniversary summit of, the, of Rio at Johannesburg, they called it Rio minus 10. Sorry, I'm just losing my spot here. I finally realized that contrary to what I thought as a child, that if I could, if we could just speak to the world leaders, that they were, they would change the world. I finally realized that they were not those people who are going to change the course of our history. Real change, real movement, lies in the communities, lies in the rural grass, in the rural and urban grassroots organizations, in networks of organ of individuals who are finding solutions and implementing them at the human level, at the cities, in the in the towns. So I decided to focus on change in the ground here at my own home and with other communities and networks that I could talk to, that I could work with, that I could feel, and that I could see. I could not wait anymore for big governments to change the world for me. And I moved here. I moved to this, arch this archipelago in northern BC. It's home to the Haida Nation. This is an empowered indigenous nation that has successfully protected its forest, resulting in a co-managed na national park reserve. It's one of the last strongholds of rich biodiversity where we can still live off the land and sea. And uh, last night, my husband and I were cutting up a big halibut head from, um, from the harvest that, um, uncle, that our uncle caught over the weekend. It's a place where we can still live in harmony with the natural world. There are many social and ecological challenges here, of course. But here, I can see how people, how individuals, and how myself are making a difference. In the last 20 years, the world has changed. I learned this through my studies. In university, I studied biology. I had to make sure that the facts and the science held up my childhood understanding that human, humankind was destroying our life support systems. I learned that the facts more than upheld that statement. I learned about climate change. I learned about giant masses of garbage floating in my beloved Pacific Ocean. I learned that we are currently undergoing the sixth mass extinction event that our planet has experienced. The ecological and societal impacts of our culture became more disturbing the more educated I became. Looking for other options, I studied other human cultures. At graduate school, I, I studied the field of ethnoecology, which is anthropology and ecology. And I learned that not every culture has destroyed its environment. I studied under indigenous elders under the west coast here of Canada, and I learned about sustainable management practices that allowed high populations to prosper for 10,000 years. And in a world where cultural diversity is also rapidly declining, I believe we desperately need to, know, to understand the traditional ecological knowledge in order to rediscover a means of managing sustainably. And finally, 20 years later, I know that the political realm of possibility has shifted. Today, I am ashamed of the environmental trend of the government of Canada. 20 years ago, I was proud to share nationality with the likes of Maurice Strong, who was the Secretary General of the Earth Summit in Rio, and other leaders in the global sustainability movement. We were respected. But we have steadily been erasing that leadership. 
In December 2010, at the Cancun climate negotiations for the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, due to Canada's regression and our notorious obstruction of international progress in negotiations, and after winning the NGO's infamous colossal fossil four times in a row, the environmental community dubbed Canada can't -nada. Today, with a majority conservative government in power, we have seen a blatant and stark agenda to expand the Alberta tar sands, to gut conservation legislation, to devalue science, and now to discredit environmental nonprofits in Canada. And it came as no surprise to anyone that last year Canada finally left the Conference of the Parties, and though even though it was one of the first countries to sign on to the Kyoto Protocol in 1998. I believe that this movement to the right in Canada reflects what has been happening at large since the Earth Summit in 1992. Rio 1992 seemed to be the culmination of the environmental popularity of the 80s. But afterwards, I think many would, cons would consider the 90s as one of the most destructive decades for global ecology. We experienced a return of the population of the environmental movement in the mid-2000s. However, this, of course, was cut short by the economic crash in 2008, and we have not recovered since then. Though our ecosystems continue to decline in a ter tailspin terrifying to any biologist, the growth of the economy remains foremost for politicians and institutions in power. And the collusion between government and corporations we've seen in the last 20 years is enough to make anyone loyal to democracy cynical. The rise of the conservatives' agenda in the political arena sorry, has been so strong that it has shifted the entire realm of what is politically possible far to the right. This means that the parties on the left are actually far more conservative than what we require if we are to become a sustainable society. And at the moment, there is a, a very powerful example of this trend at work in a Canadian issue that is powerful yes, to... Excuse me. This is the problem with having Skype in, Skype in my home office. Sorry. There is a parallel issue to the Keystone XL pipeline um, issue. Up north, we are facing the Enbridge Northern Gateway proposal. This proposal is for pipelines from the Alber our Alberta tar sands to the northwest coast to a port up a narrow weaving inlet where super tankers will then take the Albertan crude bitumen over to, uh, to Asia. Currently, a review process is underway, traveling through communities along the route, with a three-person panel listening to the testimony of how the project would affect the individuals along that route. And the coastal people of BC are taking this very, very seriously. Thousands of people are registered to participate in making presentations to the panel in an unprecedented show of engagement on this issue. Two weeks ago, the panel hearings came here to Skedeget Haida Gwaii, and I participated in this in the hearings process, and I gave a testimony for how this pipeline would affect myself and this community. And it was an incredibly empowering and moving experience to hear individuals who usually never make public statements, people who never give speeches, coming up and standing, bearing witness and testifying to testifying to how this project would threaten their beloved oceans. It was it was incredibly moving to participate in this. But there is ample indication that even with this official process happening, our government has already made the decision to go ahead and build the pipeline. Before the joint review panel had even begun, our Minister of Natural Resources stated that the pipeline is in the country's best interest. Threatened by the amount of engagement in the process and the opposition to the pipeline, the government has been cracking down on the citizens opposing the proposal. A few weeks ago, the government stated that the process was being hijacked by foreign-funded radicals, I quote, in January, a whistleblower announced that the government had labeled one of the registered interveners a nonprofit called Forest Ethics 
as an enemy of the people of Canada. Meanwhile, the lobby group Ethical Oil, which champions the use of Canadian tar sands oil, has been part of the media campaign to discredit a host of nonprofits that receive grants from American foundations, and all this even as our government has been actively lobbying for China to invest in our resources extraction. And the Edmund Pipeline is one project. There are countless resource extraction and transportation proposals in the works in BC, in Canada, and of course, as you know very well, in the world. It is clear that the current meta strategy is to turn everything from nature into profit at a blistering pace. As a citizen concerned with ecosystem health and opportunities for the future, it is exhausting to be engaged. It is overwhelming. And at the moment, it seems even impossible. We need a massive paradigm shift. I was not planning on participating at the Rio Plus 20 Earth Summit. But last year, a community of young people approached me. They asked me to join them. They asked me to help them and return to Rio for the 20 year anniversary. And I couldn't refuse these young, engaged, idealistic Canadians. They represent the Canadian Earth Summit Coalition, the Canadian civil society, society component at Rio Plus 20. We are, we Canada, a direct response to the face of our own government's failure to engage responsibly in the environmental situation and to take up our global responsibility. We are volunteers from across Canada dedicated to a different future than one that is than that which is unfolding, and we are putting our faith into the process and the negotiations of the UN and the Earth Summit. The Canadian Earth Summit Coalition conducted surveys of civil society groups, and from this we have three policy recommendations that we are challenging our country to accept at the Earth Summit this year. The first is measuring what matters. It is about values establishing a better measurement of national progress and well-being than our GDP. The second policy is about getting the prices right. The provinces of Alberta, BC and Quebec have begun to put a price on carbon. Based on this effort, we are calling the Government of Canada to eliminate fossil fuel subsidies and produce an ecological tax reform that includes a price on carbon, on carbon emissions. The third policy recommendation is that we want our, our trade to be fair. Building on efforts of cities and institutions across Canada who have adopted fair trade, we ask for the incorporation of fair trade certified products as the best practice in the federal sustainable development strategy. This is what we are asking for. These policy recommendations are idealistic. The young individuals who are putting their energy, their money, their time, their hope, into making change at the Earth Summit, summit are idealistic. And there is something truly moving about their energy and idealism. These young people show there is still hope for sustainability. And they are showing that young people still believe that they can make a difference. They are idealistic, but they are also realistic. These youth look at our world as a single planet that depends on an honest and scientific understanding of the interconnections of society, environment, and economy. They see that the opportunities for the future depends on the developed nations leading and taking responsibility. The situation is clear to them, and they have decided to put all of their energy and effort into changing our course. I'm encouraged and inspired and humbled by these young people who believe that even in the face of our government undermining our progressive environmental legacy, we can. And here lies the hope for the transformation of our society. Young people get it. Youth, those younger than myself, comprise half of the globe's population. They have everything at stake and yet they have little decision-making power. They can clearly see that their future is climate change, 
and depleted ecosystems and wars and disease over scarce water and resources. And they have not invested their lifetimes to the old school way of doing things. Change is possible for them. In fact, for youth today, the only viable option is change. People are always concerned about how do we engage the youth, but there already are so many young people who are already engaged, who are working to make a difference. We need to empower those young people to invigorate the sustainability movement. We need to listen to their ideas and energy and optimism, and we need them to speak truth to power. In 1992, I was my parents' child. In 2012, I am the mother of a two-year-old and a two-month-old baby. I now understand why the UN's plenary audience rose to their feet, why that speech that I gave when I was 12 remains the most powerful speech I've ever given. I now know the power that children have on adults. I understand the depth of love that people have for their children. There is nothing more powerful. How then can we reconcile this with the reality that we participate daily in limiting our children's future? The globalized economy has severed connections between cause and effect and the overdeveloped world given us, and in the overde overdeveloped world, given us prosperity without connection to consequence. It allows us to ignore or forget the real outcomes of our daily choices. Who is to blame? None of us, but also all of us. We are all implicit in an unsustainable system. As we look back on our progress since the Earth Summit in 1992, it would be easy to be discouraged. But today I am, I am a parent. I am a hostage to fortune, and I cannot afford to be discouraged. 20 years later, I come back to the argument I made as a child with my presence at the summit. The strongest moral imperative to act, to change, is our children. It is because of our children that we must bring back the connection between cause and effect, between our choices in the global situation, between privilege and responsibility. In identifying this moral imperative lies our hope. Our hope is love, love for our children. As a scientist, aware of the hard facts, I believe this is our most powerful weapon for positive change in our arsenal. Because we love our children, we must and we will make the changes to become sustainable. So in reflecting on 20 years in Rio, my concluding thought is this. To transform our society, we must somehow find a way to leverage this love. Perhaps if a generation of truth sayers were mobilized, their parents, the generations in power, would listen. Perhaps if their ideas and ways of doing things in the 21st century were integrated into policy or ways of pushing for change, society would transform. We need to figure out how to do this. The Earth Summit 2012 will come and go. I don't know what the legacy will be, but we must seize this moment to ask the tough questions about why our political landscape is so skewed, why we have not been more successful in turning the ecological tide. We need unity. We need a viable political alternative. We need justice and democracy as well as sustainability. We need science and we need activism and we need youth as a core part of our decision making. I want to thank you very much for listening to me this afternoon. Severin, thank you so much. I, I hope you can at least hear me. Uh, this was a wonderful speech and uh, very powerful and uh, gives us a little hope and uh, to uh, 
chew on during the rest of the day. I, I don't think we have time for questions, but I do definitely want to thank you, Severn, uh, very deeply for, for joining us. I know you're on maternity leave, and, uh, and we very much appreciate the time you've given us.